Rory Stewart, thank you for joining us here. We've sought shelter from the rain in a London pub, appropriately, um, and we're hoping to talk about love. So, unusually for politicians, uh, this is a word that you have mentioned initially in your Tory leadership campaign, and now, once again, you're running for mayor. You're also talking about love. What do you mean in a political context? Well, I mean, I think firstly, politicians have to be pretty, pretty careful using uh, big grand words like that because um, it, the, the one thing I think we all know about politicians, and I, I'm a politician, is that this is a pretty, pretty messy, difficult business. And um, I think that the public, understandably, are a bit fed up hearing us talk about anything. They don't really want to hear me talk about economic policy, let alone about love. However, uh, there is an important point, which is that our society is deeply, deeply divided. And for some reason, we are getting more and more into a sort of American sensibility where our opponents are evil. They're not just mistaken. But you can hear often, and I suppose most of my friends, to be honest, voted Remain. And the way that they view Brexit voters is increasingly sort of aggressive. And I, I feel this. I mean, I, I'm a, somebody who voted Remain. My mother voted Brexit. I live in London, I represent a Cumbrian constituency that voted Brexit, so I'm rubbing up and down against this all the time. And of course, in some ways, I'm in the middle of this because I've been somebody trying to get a compromise. I'm attacked from both sides. People literally in the street, when they shout at me, it takes me a moment to work out whether they're shouting because they're a Remainer or a Brexiteer. So, you, so you want to encourage... I mean, how does love fit into that? Love for difference, love for people who don't agree with you. How does that work in a political context? Well, I, I suppose that fundamentally it is about showing love for another human being, whoever that human being is. And that means that you need to try, it's very, very difficult to do, but try to live out your values when you engage with them and try not to be thrown off balance by the fact that they're angry with you. Try to get beyond your disagreements and try desperately to remember that they are like you, that we're all uh, an odd bundle of insecurities, vanities, strengths, weaknesses, and that, um, and that we may do bad things, but that we're not intrinsically bad people. So we are a, in part, philosophy website, so you'll forgive the technical question, but do you, do you mean agape here, or do you mean as in the love of all humankind in the Christian sense, or do you think you mean philia, which is a sort of brotherly love, or are we talking about eros, a kind of love of beauty, erotic love? What kind of love are we talking about? So I, I suppose I'm, I'm talking more about your first type of love. In other words, um, and, and it's not uniquely Christian. You would have it within Islam, you would have it within the Buddhist tradition, but it, it's fundamentally predicated on the notion that uh, we are equal in a very profound sense, which is that we're all imbued with equal dignity. And there are different ways of thinking that through. You, you could, uh, depending on your religious tradition, obviously talk about your soul. You could talk about being God-created. Uh, in a more contemporary sense, you could just talk about being inheritors of this odd thing called consciousness reaching from birth to death, or that we're fellow sufferers on this funny journey of life. But whatever it is, it, it has to be an idea that you and I, and literally everybody, mm -hmm. and that means being able to show love, of course, for the homeless person, but also show love for Bill Gates. I mean, one has to be able to... Why Bill Gates in particular? <laughs> well, I, I, I saw him last week and, oh, ha and had, a, had a disagreement with him. But I think, right. the, I think the fundamental point is that it's very easy for us to think, yes, this person is worthy of love, but somebody else isn't. So there's, you know, often in our dispute, there's a notion of the top 1% or the top 0.1% who somehow are... It's okay to abuse them, but it's not okay to abuse other people. What's, you know, what I think is, is brave and interesting about this is you know, politics has basically been flattened into economics and a sort of technocratic discussion for the last decades. It's been increasingly like that. 
Um, and politicians are understandably nervous about getting into kind of highfalutin, high-value ideas because they either might sound didactic or they might sound ridiculous, and politicians don't like signing either of those things. Um, but I wonder whether you agree that, if, in fact, not talking about values, not talking about those things, is part of what got us into this mess in the first place. And so it may be more dangerous not to talk about them than to talk about them. I think it's much more dangerous. I mean, w one of the reasons we've been unable, I think, to resolve this Brexit vote is that exactly as you say, that people are used to any thinking in economic terms. So uh, many Remainers, you know, and I voted Remain, will say this uh, is uh, going to be bad for the British economy. We can't put an exact number on it, but you know, five, seven, nine percent GDP impact. And therefore, why are you doing it? And for some reason, it doesn't seem to work to say, well, I mean, there is a reason to do it, which is that people voted for it. Right? And let's try to get in. And they voted for non-economic reasons, at least in large measure. They could have voted for non-economic reasons. Uh, they could simply have wanted to do it for no particular reason. You could simply say that we are a nation together that resolves our disagreements through a democratic process called a vote, where the people who vote more in one direction than another win. But those are all, in philosophical terms, different types of argument from whether or not it's a good deal. So I get in these extraordinary conversations where everyone says, but we've already got, you know, I'm trying to uh, advocate for a soft Brexit deal, for Theresa May's deal, or whatever. So, well, we've already got the best deal. And I don't seem to be able to say, well, <laughs> but the point is that people voted to leave. And le let me add another dimension to this. Uh, I, as an MP, promised to respect the result of the referendum, as did every other MP. We were all asked by television media repeatedly during the referendum campaign, will you uphold the result even mm -hmm. if it goes against you? And we all said again and again, we promised to do it. No. Again, people don't put much weight on the fact that we've promised, and promised not just as individuals. So somebody said to me, oh, that's my, I often promise to buy my, my daughter an ice cream, right? doesn't mean I have to buy her an ice cream. It's different when a member of parliament and a political party and a government who have themselves created the referendum promise to uphold the result of that referendum. It's different to promising an ice cream, right? So there, the, the there's, a, there's a, an element of... of commitment there, which is a, a value in itself. But I wonder, do you feel that you now kind of understand? Because what's so interesting about the Brexit point is that it kind of shows this, this tension between pragmatism and kind of more romantic, harder to define ideals. And we've just been talking about love, which is, would be one of those. Um, and in a way, that puts you on the kind of Brexit side of the argument, because you know there are issues of sovereignty, issues of a sort of um, wish to have agency over your life, and things that are much harder to put on a chart or explain economically than the Remain arguments. Um, you know, so I wonder, do you now, having gone through this process, have a kind of deeper sympathy with the, the impulse behind the Brexit vote? I definitely have a deep sympathy for the impulse. And I definitely feel that the only way that you could argue back against it is not really in economic terms. It would be to say that there are other values which the Brexiteer respects and honours, which are not being honoured through this process. So if I am arguing, as I often am, for a soft Brexit, what I would say to them is, look, you care about sovereignty. Right? So you wanted to take power back from a European parliament to a British parliament, so treat the British parliament with respect. You, you, you can't, on the one hand, be, as Jacob pretends to be, the great romantic traditionist who loves traditional British institutions, and then be contemptuous of the British Parliament be contemptuous to the Supreme Court. I mean, it's, it's very worrying that some of the hard Brexiteers start quoting, you know, Oliver Cromwell's response to Parliament, or start sort of writing them all off as, or doing people against Parliament stuff. But they're really. too revolutionary for your tastes. Uh, yeah, theoretically, I, I thought they were sort of people who were romantic about parliamentary sovereignty, the rule of law, and all the bits of the unwritten constitution and the monarchy and all sort of thing. And actually, they turn out to be surprisingly sort of casual about the way they treat the Queen when it comes to prerogation or the way that they think about parliament or parliamentary votes. Is the same tension not found within you though, I wonder? I mean, uh, you know, well, I've watched you during these campaigns and there is a kind of strong pragmatic 
instinct. And that has prevailed in the Brexit question. And you have kind of spoken as the pragmatist. And you talk about getting things done being your highest priority. And then yet, there is also a romantic Rory, who, as you say, loves tradition and the countryside and the, and the you know, harder to define great things about the country. It feels like sort of pragmatism won over when it came to Brexit, but perhaps it shouldn't have done. I mean, you know, the, the, you're on record for having said that you didn't think Boris would get a, a new deal because pr pragmatic Rory would tell you it wasn't possible. But in some kind of romantic way, he's managed to do something unexpected. You know, do you feel you've learnt something from that? Well, I've definitely learnt uh, that I was wrong and that my way of analysing that uh, underestimated his ability to do this. I mean, there are excuses I could make, and I suppose the most fundamental excuse is that the deal that he's gone for is in fact a deal which existed 18 months ago and which we thought he'd already rejected, which was the all Ireland backstop. That said, I said repeatedly, he's never going to get a new deal out of Europe, and he did. Why do you think he succeeded against your expectation? Because I assumed wrongly that he would be attached to the DUP. So when people said to me, um, no, 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 he's going to go from all-land backstop, he's going to sell out the DUP, I said, no, he can't do that because, you know, he said publicly that he would never accept, you know, he went to the DUP conference, he'd never accept any kind of customs checks in the Irish Sea. And, and I also thought the ERG was romantic about the union. So I also said, the thing you need to understand, I'd say, is these people like Owen Paterson deeply care about Northern Ireland and its place in the United Kingdom. And people would sort of snigger at me and say, well, that's not really true when push comes to shove. Do you right? think they've sold out? In well, I, I don't know. I'm surprised. I mean, this is all part of my general uncertainty about what they're doing. I mean, I, I, I don't know at what point the sort of things, the sort of what they evoke, which is quite a traditional Tory vision of the United Kingdom, of which unionism, and, and remember, it's a Conservative Unionist Party because of Northern Ireland, not because of Scotland. I mean, I, I use it a lot in Scotland, but it was called that because of Northern Ireland, right? And the Tory party was formed in the 19th century because of its desire to keep Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom. I thought that must matter to them because I imagined that's what drove them. But in fact... They've become more pragmatic than you would like, well, in, in a sense. I think that... There has obviously been a tension right the way through the Thatcher era, encapsulating people like John Redwood. I mean, is he really a man who's deeply romantic about history, tradition, union, nation, or is he just a sort of extraordinary kind of Vulcan-like free marketeer who, um, or, or is he just somebody who enjoys being a contrarian? I mean, that, that's a, uh, so, so, you know, he's also got, I believe, peculiar views on climate change, which presumably is, not uh, as one might imagine. You know, obviously, my Remainer friends would say it's because he's, you know, he's not bright. He's only quite bright, but he seems to be a sort of mm. professional contrarian. And and I, I guess the hard Brexiteers must have been professional contrarians for thirty years. That's what's kept them going. So they, they have their own ideological conflicts going on. Obviously, yeah. um, I just want to come back to this mm. idea because I think it's really important that somehow. You know, Boris is almost quite a sympathetic figure to, to this way of thinking because, you know, it may, and it may be more eros than agape that he excels in, but, you know, there's no doubt that there's a force of personality that was missing in Theresa May. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you watch him walking around these European summits and everyone is laughing around yeah. him. There's a kind of circle yeah. of, you know, and somehow that seems to have had an effect in changing what appeared to be the fundamentals. You know, so we all thought these things mm. were fixed. Yeah. I, I wonder how you would characterise that. You know, is, he's, he's is he bending the f history to the force of his own personality? Um, he is an extraordinary individual. I mean, he's an individual I find very disturbing. He's not my type of man. But he's clearly um, somebody who, in a way, more than anyone in the world, has always got away with things. I mean, his whole life has basically, you know, <laughs> When I said to him, um, you're not going to get a new deal out of Europe, you're never going to be able to leave by 31st of October, he will, I think, at some level, have thought, this guy sounds like all my school teachers, all my newspaper editors. He's lived a whole life in which sort of slightly earnest people are saying to him, now, Boris, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You're not done your homework. You're not doing it in the right way. 
these are the facts. Concentrate on the details. You know, the world doesn't work like that. You don't get to you know, make up stories about Princess and the Tower of London and keep your job in the Times. You don't get to. He didn't get to keep his job in that in that instance. But, <laughs> but in the end, he seems to get away with it. Yeah. I mean, and, and again and Why? again, Why? and again and again, he gets away with it. Well. I suppose it's a form of charm. I mean, I, I, I saw it myself when I was working from the Foreign Office. He would do something that I would think was completely monstrous and totally undermine everything I was doing as an African minister, in an absent-mindedly. You know, he'd take a call from the Kenyan Foreign Minister and contradict our entire government policy, and I'd then go in to try to be cross with him. Yeah. But when you go in to be cross with him, of course, it's a, uh, he sort of diffuses it very quickly and talks his way out of it, and you end up outside the door wondering what happened. Mm. So you feel a bit like a sort of... It's a political uh, skill, isn't it? Well, you feel like a sort of abused wife going in to complain <laughs> about some monstrosity that your partner has done, and then sort of being talked out of it and charmed out of it. And, mm. um, so it's a, it's a political skill, it's a human skill. It's the skill of somebody who um, doesn't believe in disciplining himself. I mean, he, he, I mean if we were talking... Greek philosophy, he's fascinated by this word akrasia. He loves the idea that, that the reason he's not, in Aristotle's sense, an ethical human being is that he lacks control, lacks self-control. And he's organised the whole life around. Quite successfully yeah, so far. Yeah. So let's come back to you. Yeah. You are running for mayor of London. You described, um, and, and sometimes say in speeches, how public opinion has moved from being in a kind of bell shape where people are clustered around the centre to a U shape where yep. people are clustered around the extremes. Yep. And your message is a, is a healing message of the centre ground mm. and therefore there aren't very many people in your patch. So, you know, aren't you going to need exactly those kind of special skills to pull off a similar kind of miracle? And do you think you've got them? Well, I definitely haven't got his skills. I mean, it, well, you know, I'm, I'm not Boris. I'm a, compared to him, I'm a very sort of... Um, I, I'm... Um, I suppose I'm a more serious kind of person. But you've got, you've got something going on. I mean, you've got this, this growing following. You know, something is happening around. But I'm, I'm clearly less funny than he is. I mean, I think I suppose what I'm, I'm trying to say. Um, and I'm quite sort of boringly earnest about certain kinds of things. Um, my, 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 I'm a little bit... I'm, I'm more puritanical than he is, oddly. I mean, I may sort of be a sort of Tory, which is meant to be associated with the Cavaliers, but in th there's a strong sort of... More moralistic. Streak of Puritanism, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I do believe that you can bring people together, but the way to bring people together is through, or I would try to do it, through humility and through listening. In other words, the, the, the truth of the matter that politicians struggle with again and again is that the idea that some middle-aged man has the answer to more than one millionth of the issues or problems in our country is clearly monstrous, right? It's ridiculous. You know, how much time I spend swatting away reading books on economics, city planning, transport, policing, etc. I'm never going to... I mean, I felt this um, in um, Camberwell uh, three days ago, where I was sitting down with a guy who had been joined a gang at 12 and at 18 had been arrested for kidnapping murder, and I could feel sitting with him a sort of force of experience, which I'm never going to have. And, I, and it was interesting for me because I've spent a lot of time uh, in war, in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, in quite extreme situations. So I, I've seen people killed, I've been shot at, I've gone through all of that. But I realized that I didn't have the lived experience of this man just in the whole way that he spoke. And, and the journey, extraordinary journey of, that he's gone on of turning his life around, that he essentially decided he didn't want to do this anymore, went to the job center, got a shirt and a tie, and went and got a job in Argos with all his mates saying, so, wait a sec, I'm making 80,000 pounds a year selling drugs, what are you doing? And this is, this is that kind of big guy with two gold teeth. And, and, and he was intelligent and articulate, but he just exuded experience yeah experience lived experience so, yeah. do you, you feel then that, that you're the way you're going to heal this riven society then your kind of special skill in doing this is something about 
humility and listening, that's how you're going to bring people together. Well, my, my instinct is that the, the miracle and the problem of a modern democracy is that we are now so educated, so informed, so empowered. You know, it's a society of 50 million amateur experts. Mm. There is no deference anymore. So the model of the House of Commons worked in the 19th century when... F the great man. Yeah, fundamentally in the 19th century, we were still a relatively rural, relatively uneducated, relatively deferential class-based society in which the House of Commons were a group of very wealthy men who um, were able, carried themselves as leaders and were able to make decisions very quickly and of course the senior civil service all came from their backgrounds. It would have been easier back then. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, well that sort of government is completely different. It wasn't really democratic government in the modern sense, right? It was a sort of, it's an oligarchy, right, Victorian Britain. Now today we really are beginning to become a real democracy and that means that the whole relationship between the Member of Parliament and the public has to change. Otherwise, we're going to be less than some of our parts. If we put all the brains, energy and lived experience of our society through 650 rather flawed and sometimes not deeply impressive individuals in the House of Commons, we ain't going to get anywhere, right? So somehow... A channel or a yeah, we need to find a system to, and often a system to get round us and empower people. So clearly the way that it actually works is that you give people the freedom to do what they're good at doing, right? And the bigger the organisation, the more you have to admit you don't understand what, you can't possibly understand what all these people are doing. You just have to trust them and free them up. So we need, and this is what I would feel in London, that there's got to be some way of harnessing that. We've got love, we've got humility. It sounds quite Christian. Are you a Christian? I go to church on a Sunday. Um, I I think I struggle uh, with my faith, and I, I have since I was 13 years old, but I think the, uh, the language and the, um, the worldview of Christianity, I find the most um, powerful, helpful, wise, unlocking guide to, well, to, to our purpose in life, or how we deal with each other as human beings. Okay, final question for you, Rory. Do you think you're going to win? Do I think I'm going to win? Um, I think it's early days. I think I can win. My ability to win is dependent on whether I can genuinely inspire tens of thousands of people around London to throw their weight into it. I'm an underdog. I have no party, no money, no campaign. I'm having to build it from the grassroots. But I believe that we are better than what we currently are. And if I can make people see that the Labour Party and the Conservative Party are not really what's going to make London extraordinary, and that together we can make London extraordinary, and that no mayor of London has really done for London what mayors of New York have done for New York, and that there is no reason at all why this city couldn't over the next eight years be staggering, why this couldn't be the greatest eight years in London's history. But that is going to depend on my ability to communicate that and inspire and find and make a team. I mean, it's not something that I can do as one man on my own. It's going to be fascinating to watch. Thanks for chatting to us, Rory. Thank you.